Well, I want to thank everybody um, and welcome you to the webinar series from the Ioneer Foundation called Sight and Sound Bites. Uh, this bi-weekly webinar series highlights research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Today's topic really is a fascinating topic. It's called Using Our Brain to See, Cortical Vision and Movements of Our Eyes. I'm Lawton Snyder, CEO of the Ioneer Foundation. The Ioneer Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, and cancers of the head and neck at the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide from the Ioneer Foundation to support research are only made possible because of philanthropic support. Uh, for those of you who've been supporting the Ioneer Foundation, we thank you. And for those who'd like to know more about how you can support, uh, please uh, reply to uh, Mr. Craig Smith, who, uh, whose email is in your invitation. Let me start by introducing um, our distinguished chairman, Dr. Jose Elaine Sahel. He's a distinguished professor and chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, an exceptional class professor at Sorbonne University in Paris, and the Ioneer Foundation Endowed Chair. Um, Dr. Sahel, it's always a pleasure to see you. It's always a pleasure to introduce you. Thank you for coming to uh, introduce and uh, start us off with this program uh, for, for today. Well, thank you very much, Lonnie. Thank you to the attendees. Uh, so this topic today might be a bit uh, cryptic to many of you, and uh, this is certainly uh, a field that uh, usually the public is not too much aware. What we want you to be aware of is that we see with our brain, uh, although the obvious uh, is that we see through the eyes. And uh, the visual system is a multi-layer, very complex system that processes information from the eye to the brain. And uh, Patrick was kind enough to put together this image. The uh, image is captured at the eye level, but the place where we see is really at the cortical level in the brain. And we have many areas in the brain uh, that corresponds to our uh, initial processing of information and a lot of interrelationship between the information, sensory information, memory experience, a lot of things. And uh, we have different uh, areas and different pathways, actually uh, two main pathways in the, in the cortex. Why is this important? Not just because it's uh, incredibly amazing how we see and how visual system is functioning, but also because it provides a lot of opportunity for vision rehabilitation and potentially vision restoration. So we decided uh, years ago, and we got wonderful support from charities, especially the Mellon Foundation, to create a cortical vision program in our department, but it's going to focus on the potential in the future to provide patients who lost vision but in a very, very disastrous situation where above the optic nerve or sometimes the eye itself is damaged in a way that you cannot really bring the information again through the eye to the brain, going directly to the brain. But because of the complexity of the visual system, this looked for many decades as a daunting tax, something that you could not achieve. Uh, we understand better and better the visual system is the best on the two system in the brain, and it's actually a model for understanding how we, the brain is functioning. So there is now an opportunity to get directly to the brain to stimulate and potentially to restore some vision. But an important component of that is what we call vision attention and how this is connected to what we call cognition, how this does integrate in our understanding of what we see and the interpretation and what we decide to see and what we decide not to focus on, which is the field of visual attention. And in this respect, the eye movements are extremely important because you direct your gaze to what you want to see. Uh, and there are some automatic part to that and some voluntary part to that. So over the past very few years, thanks to this support that was really vectored through the Eye India Foundation, we were able to recruit already two top scientists uh, coming from the leading institutions in the country. And they uh, are now building this group and we are about to recruit another one and hopefully to grow that group even more because we need a lot of expertise on that. The goal is that at some point we would be leading this effort to restore vision at the cortical level. Without further ado, I think I'm going to get started with the uh, next speaker, who is uh, one of uh, our really recent recruits, uh, a top uh, scientist in the field. So I guess the next one is 
Patrick or Jim? It's Patrick. So Patrick Mayo, we recruited him from the uh, Duke University. Patrick was actually uh, trained in many places. His CV is very impressive, including Pittsburgh, actually, a while ago. So he, he didn't have to be convinced that this is a great city to live. But uh, he came for many other reasons, the scientific community, and uh, the fact that his research is fitting very well into the priorities of the department. So Patrick, if you can take over from me. Thank you, Dr. Sahel, um, and thanks to everyone for attending today. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to present some of my work uh, that we're doing in the lab. Um, so I've watched many of these seminars in the past year, uh, certainly the ones related to vision, and I know that uh, they've focused a lot on visual deficits and disorders of the eyes. So we all know the cost of these disorders, and I've put some of the statistics up here. Um, conditions like glaucoma and strabismus, macular degeneration, among many others. Um, these conditions affect millions of Americans and lead to healthcare costs in the billions of dollars each year. Um, these problems are expected to continue to increase as the population demographics skew towards older age groups. And although these are somewhat concerning trends, uh, I think it's also important to see them as motivation for new treatments for these visual disorders. And as I'll talk about today, um, even entirely new avenues of treatment where we can potentially circumvent problems in the eye and perhaps capitalize on our understanding of the brain. So I wanna convince you today that vision involves both the eyes and the brain. Um, so we know what the eyes do. And if you don't, there happens to be a fantastic catalog of videos on the Eye Near Foundation website of previous seminars. Um, but what does the brain do? And now that's a, that's a big question and probably worthy of multiple months of, of webinars. Um, but today, James Herman and I are gonna review some of the key ideas about the role of the brain and vision, and specifically how we can move forward with this knowledge to develop maybe altogether new treatments for visual disorders and new approaches to visual restor restoration. So what does the brain do exactly for vision? Um, if there's one idea I want you to remember from my portion of the seminar today, um, it's this. And that's that the brain filters visual information and adapts to different situations. So that is the huge task that the brain carries out all day, all the time, uh, hopefully. And the brain is receiving tons of information from the eyes and it can't use it all. So it's constantly trying to determine what do I need to see now in order to reach some goal or to reach some objective? So there's two parts to this statement about the brain. Um, and I think the first part might not be immediately clear what we're talking about. So let me give you a, a, what I think is a clear example. This is a page from Where's Waldo? Um, hopefully you've seen these before, but if not, you're looking for a sort of tall, skinnyish guy wearing a red and white sweatshirt and a red and white striped pullover hat and black rimmed glasses, that's Waldo. So Waldo is here somewhere on the page and all of the visual information about Waldo is entering your eyes right now. Um, if you're watching this on a phone or an iPad or your computer, uh, you can prove, your, you prove this to yourself because I bet you can see the edges of your screen and you can probably see whatever's behind you in the room or behind the screen. So if that's the room or a window or something like that. So everything in the Waldo picture is entering the eyes. Uh, it's just being filtered by the brain. Now, of course, it would be nice if we can say, brain, engage the Waldo filter, and then voila, Waldo jumps out at us. Um, but unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, that's not how brains work. Um, but why can't we see Waldo right away? So one of the primary ways our brains filter what we see is through a process called visual attention, which Dr. Hell mentioned in his introduction. This is something both James and I have studied extensively, and despite it being a somewhat tricky process to pin down in the brain, its existence and importance is easy to show. So for example, if I ask you to pick out red items on the page, you'll notice that you can quickly and effortlessly just look around at red items from one to the next. And if I ask you to switch and do the same thing for blue items, you can do that just as easily and look around at blue items. So that ability to switch your attention from red to blue at will uh, nicely ties into the second point about the brain. Oh, sorry, I don't wanna leave the Waldo picture without showing you where Waldo is. Uh, that, would be, that would be a crime. Uh, so there's Waldo in the upper corner there if you didn't find him. Um, 
So the second point that this leads into is namely that the brain adapts to a given situation. So if you need to look for Waldo, then you prioritize looking for a tall guy in a red and white shirt. And that's your brain that does this prior, prior, uh, prioritizing. And if you're done looking for Waldo and you just wanna sit and relax and maybe appreciate steam coming off your hot cup of coffee, you can do that. But then you might notice a black spot zip by in the background and now you see a fly next to your window and so on and so on. And this is one of the primary functions of the brain, picking out the pieces of the world that enter our eyes and using that for a purpose. So I think later on, James is gonna talk more about learning and behavior. And that's obviously a huge part of what's going on here. Um, I wanna take a few minutes to point out another aspect of the brain's role in vision. And whether it's searching for Waldo or watching the house fly, we are constantly making eye movements. And you might've noticed this when you were looking at the, at the Waldo picture. Um, we actually make more eye movements per day than heartbeats. And eye movements take items in the world and allow them to fall on the best part of the retina for vision, um, where we have the most rods and cones. So because of this, I think of vision as this entire processing loop. Um, the eyes see the world, the information that enters the eyes travels through the brain and typically contributes to the next eye movement. So that moves the eye muscles. And then that changes the visual world that the eyes see again. And the eyes see something new and the whole process repeats itself. So in this way, the eyes and brain work in a continuous loop where we see something, make a decision about it and about where to look next. And then we move the eyes, which makes the process start all over again. And I wanna emphasize here that when I say decisions, uh, I'm not talking about conscious decisions like should I get bacon or mushrooms on my pizza tonight? Um, instead, these are rapid ongoing decisions that we're largely unaware of, of course, unless things go wrong. Um, the brain carries out these types of decisions to help us successfully navigate a particular situation and to help us successfully navigate our day. And again, this loop happens about three times every second of the day. So this is a fundamental part of daily behavior and of how we interact visually with the world. So I wanna show you an illustrative example of the kinds of experiments we do in the lab um, and, how these, and how this idea of a constant loop between the eye and the brain for vision is supported by these experiments. So the experiment is very simple here. Um, animals are trained to watch a computer screen and we present a small patch of dots like this. Um, it's not important that I'm using a patch of dots here. This could be a smiley face, this could be a single dot. Um, this patch of dots just helps us with neuronal recordings later. The animal's job is to keep their eyes on the dots, and you can do the same thing at home if you're watching this. Um, after about one second of looking at that patch of dots, then they move smoothly across the screen. Um, so I'm not sure if everyone is going to see smooth motion, smooth motion at home on their computer screen because of internet delays and lags, but uh, I promise you in the, in the laboratory, they just smoothly translate across the screen. Okay, so the, the task is pretty simple. Before the animals move their eyes to follow the dots, we do one special manipulation. And there's a little jump of dots. So if you're watching that patch of dots now, um, you can keep an eye on it. We call this a pulse of motion. Um, so let me show you, it's very quick and that's it. Um, and I can try to do it again here. Just a little jump of this patch of dots. And it only lasts 50 milliseconds in our experiments. The key manipulation is sometimes we present this brief pulse early during the time when the animals were waiting for the dots to move across the screen. And sometimes we present, presented it late during the time when they were waiting for the dots to move. In both cases, the eyes were always still and focused on the patch of dots. And then afterwards, the dots drift across the screen. So I'm gonna spare you the backstory of how we came up with this experiment. Um, the point for now is to keep in mind that the stimulus presented on the screen, what the eyes see is always the same. And the eyes naturally follow the motion dots, the motion of the dots almost reflexively. So the little pulse of dots occurs sometimes during the early part of the um, trial while they're waiting for one second and during the late part while they're waiting. Uh, the blue trace that you see on your screen is a measure of the eye speed of when the eyes look at that little motion pulse. Um, there's eye speed on the vertical axis and time on the x-axis. So as you look at this little pulse, the eyes increase their speed and they decrease their speed. A very simple process. Um, so remember that these pulses were shown during that waiting period. This is an example of 
how the eyes move when you present that pulse early during the waiting period. If you present the same exact pulse up, oh, and I should point out here, sorry, the white dotted line uh, also in that plot is just a control condition of when we don't present a motion pulse at all. So there you can see that the eye speed remains around zero because the eyes remain still just staring at the motionless um, patch of dots. So this is what happens when we present the stimulus early. When we present this, the same exact motion pulse late, we see a larger change in eye speed. Now, this might not seem like a big difference, um, but we repeat this experiment thousands of times over many days, and this always happens. What's more, I'm showing you the results of just one size of a motion pulse here. And in fact, I showed different five different motion pulse sizes to the subjects. And when we do that, you can see that even though you're, you're presenting the same exact uh, motion pulse to the retina, you're receiving different responses of how the eyes move during the later period. So why does this happen? Um, it presumably has to do with the animal's overall readiness to make an eye movement, which is happening hundreds of milliseconds later. So this is a simple manipulation of what is shown on a screen can be used as a way to reveal sophisticated cognitive factors that influence how and what we see. So in this case, we're likely seeing the influence of things like readiness or expectation. And just to review the overarching idea here, uh, we're making sure that the eyes receive exactly the same input but they're moving in different ways as an output of the visual system. So of course, there's something in the middle here between the eye and the eye muscles. And we then went on to record from different regions of the brain to try to figure out what is happening here and specifically why eyes were making a larger response during this later time period. Um, so there's just a somewhat sophisticated, uh, well, simplified but complicated uh, circuit here on the left uh, of the eyes. The eyes um, then send information into LGN and V1 in the brain. There's a few brain regions, and those brain regions then connect back to the eye muscles, because if we want to move our eyes, we have to send a command to move the eyes to our eye muscles. Um, I'm going to show you recordings in two brain areas, and those are um, MT and FEF. Um, the abbreviations are not hugely important now, um, but they're uh, surrounded by the red boxes. So these are the uh, eye movement uh, responses that I showed you on the last slide, and I'm just putting them here again as a reminder. Um, when we record from multiple neurons in area MT, so if you follow the map there on the left, MT is about two connections away from the eye. We see visual responses. We see that the neurons fire in response to those motion pulses as expected, but those motion pulses early and late are um, practically the same. So they're not the thing that's allowing the eyes to move in different ways. They're actually more like the stimulus that's presented. So it didn't look like how the eyes moved um, in the response, uh, how the eyes moved in the motion pulses above in blue. So we recorded in the second brain region. This is in FEF. And now you can see that FEF, if you look at the circuit on the left, is closer to the eye muscles. And when we record in FEF, what we find is that the type of change in brain activity could account for the change in eye speeds shown at the top. So this sort of understanding of the roles of different brain regions, I think will be vitally important for any effort to restore vision. And ultimately, we, wonder, we want to understand what visual information is entering and leaving each brain area and how exactly that information is passed to other brain regions. So I want to really quickly go through uh, one other project in lab, just because it's one of the most exciting and fun ones for me. Um, we're working on determining how and when the eyes are moving by only looking at neuronal activity in the brain. So we're making estimates of eye movements by only looking at brain activity, not actually um, always recording the eye movements, but I'll go through the details here. So typically we're, we record eye movements with a camera and we use that to watch um, where an animal is looking. So that's what I'm gonna show you with the black traces here. So we can move a patch of dots down into the right, and then we can watch the animal's eyes move down into the right. This is exactly what I'm showing you here. This is a black trace of eye movements as if you're just watching the eyes move on a screen. Um, and we can, of course, present the stimulus in a bunch of different directions. We can have it go in the opposite direction. We can have it go more downward and more upwards. So these are the eye movements that we recorded with a camera pointing at the eye, watching the eyes move. 
Now, while we're doing this, we can record in particular brain areas that are responsive to eye movements, are brain areas that help generate the commands to move the eyes. And we're not doing, with a lot, we're not doing this with a lot of neurons yet, maybe a few dozen, uh, maybe one dozen. Um, and with these neuronal responses alone and ignoring the recordings of the eye movements, we can basically estimate the eye movements, uh, I'm not gonna say perfectly, but very, very well. So using only the activity of the neurons, uh, we can do a really good job of estimating where the eyes are moving and in what direction. So given what I've told you so far about the constant interaction of vision and eye movements, I think this sort of approach that relies on the brain's internal estimate of eye position will also be an invaluable part of future visual assistive devices. So how do we get there? Um, how do we make these types of treatments a reality? And I'll illustrate a basic idea here with a simplified eye brain circuit. Um, the brain here is just illustrated with a bunch of colored circles that are um, labeling different visual areas of the brain. Uh, and of course, visual information is routed from the eyes to the brain to multiple areas of the brain um, through these black arrows. Now, a wide range of visual disorders essentially lead to a removal or distortion of the visual information from the eye to the brain. And a huge part of our current research efforts are aimed at listening in on these visual channels, like in the brain recordings I showed you on the previous slide. We want to figure out what impaired versus unimpaired brain activity sounds like and looks like. And most importantly, we want to figure out ways where we can insert activity and replace this disrupted communication channels with reliable visual information. And so we're on our way towards that goal with our current research. Given that we've, uh, given all that we've learned about the brain so far, um, I think it's fair to ask why brain implants are not readily available as assistive visual devices yet. And identifying these obstacles will, of course, help guide us uh, and help focus on a most effective path forward. So one of the biggest obstacles is the sheer mass and complexity of the brain. So we've known for decades now that more than half of our cerebral cortex, that's the wrinkly outer part that, um, that you can see on the left, and that's in the schematic on the right, um, more than half of that is related to just processing visual information, information that enters our eyes. What's more, if you look at the entire brain, and here I'm showing a, a plastic model of the brain cut down the middle, so you can see um, the many subcortical regions, again, uh, issues that I think James will talk about next as well, about half of your entire brain is either directly or indirectly related to vision. So thankfully, we've already made excellent progress mapping out these many brain areas and their functions. One of the most interesting topics of current research is now how those different brain areas talk to one another. So what I'm showing you here is a classic map of connections from Fellman and Van Essen. Um, these are mapping the connections between visual areas of the brain. So there's retinal ganglion cells at the very bottom. You might see RGC down there. And as you move towards the front of, of the brain, you move upwards along this hierarchy. Um, so as you can see, the circuitry is not simply area A connects to area B, which connects to area C and so on. Um, there are what we call feed forward and feed back connections, as well as multiple interconnected routes to the same destination. Um, so it's an understatement to say that the brain is complicated, but the majority of visual neuroscience that's been uh, used to uncover what we've shown you so far has mainly been done recording one single neuron at a time. And this approach was surprisingly fruitful and productive for decades, um, but it makes it very difficult to study things like communication between brain regions when you can only listen to one neuron in one region at a time. So in the past 10 years or so, there's been a major technological advance that now allows us to record dozens or even hundreds and soon to be thousands of neurons at the same time. So I'm showing you one tiny recording device here for recording um, from a population of 100 neurons at the same time. So these new technologies for recording brain activity have facilitated the development of so-called brain computer interfaces or BCIs. So there have been enormously successful um, BCIs uh, using this type of approach, including cochlear implants for hearing. Um, there have been pioneering work here in Pittsburgh on providing the ability to move an artificial limb or restoring the sensation of touch. And of course, we, 
of course, we continue to make amazing progress with retinal implants for restoring vision. Now, retinal implants are unquestionably a critical piece of the puzzle for restoring vision and mitigating vision loss. Um, but I think they are only a piece of the puzzle when we're talking about a truly complete and comprehensive restoration of vision. Um, I think that will require intervention at both the levels of the eye and the brain. And we've already started working towards that goal. So with that, I'll pause and I'll let James uh, tell us more. I just wanna briefly acknowledge the Department of Ophthalmology for their support, as well as the many people in my lab who can all be found on our lab website. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Patrick. So <clears throat> happy to introduce uh, Jim Herman now. Jim uh, joined us a bit more recently. His arrival was a bit delayed by COVID, but now he's with us. And uh, he comes from the very prestigious lab at the NIH. And uh, his work is uh, both complementary and very parallel to the work of Patrick and uh, very crucial to these ideas of cortical stimulation in the blind. So, Jim. Thank you, Dr. Sahel. Patrick just showed you some of the ways that primate vision happens across multiple areas of the cerebral cortex. There's no doubt that the impressive visual abilities of primates rely on the exquisite architecture and structured connectivity amongst cortical areas of the brain. But biological organisms were using brains for vision for hundreds of millions of years before the cerebral cortex evolved. This observation leads to a line of inquiry that reveals some deeply important facts about primate cortical vision. So I'm gonna start that line of inquiry by asking how does an animal without a visual cortex use visual information to guide behavior? This is a toad. Toads and other amphibians have relatively fixed stereotyped behavioral responses for specific visual stimuli. Let me show you. The frog notices the bee, orients toward it, and then executes a prey catching maneuver. Here it is again, slowed down a little bit. How does the frog decide that he should do this? What sort of visual information tells the frog that there's prey nearby to catch? This question was addressed in a relatively straightforward way in the laboratory by presenting a toad with an experimentally controlled stimulus, a moving square, and identifying the stimulus conditions that evoked prey catching behavior. In the data shown here in this graph, I wanna make sure I can show you guys. In the data shown here in this graph, the experimenters has systematically varied the size of the moving square presented to the toad and then measured how frequently an orienting movement resulted. At the far left side of this axis, when the size of the stimulus is very small, uh, about the size of your thumbnail when held at arm's distance, the toad was fairly uninterested and only infrequently oriented towards the square, towards the moving square. But as the size of the square increases, we can see that the toad gets more interested. He's orienting towards the square most frequently when the stimulus is eight degrees on a side. After that, as the square gets even bigger, the orienting behavior decreases and then switches entirely. Once the square gets to about 25 degrees or bigger, something around there, the toad doesn't orient towards the stimulus to execute prey catching, but instead turns away, indica indicative instead of predator escape behavior. These data demonstrate that the toad is able to be visually selective. Specific behaviors are elicited under certain conditions, but not others. The toad recognizes when it's appropriate to execute prey catching and also when it's best to switch strategies from attacking to running away. Let's look at the toad brain, see how they do this. In frogs and toads, visual processing happens here in the optic tectum. Frogs also have a forebrain or a, or a telencephalon, also called a cerebrum which in primates is what has evolved into the cerebral hemispheres with its extensively folded outer bark or cortex. Now on the right, I'm showing an image that illustrates a range of forebrains uh, intended to capture how the forebrain evolved. It starts up at the top with smaller, smoother forebrains of fish and then progresses down 
to the larger and more familiar wrinkled shape in mammals and finally to primates like us at the bottom. As you can see, this change in structure constitutes a substantial growth and reorganization of the central nervous system. For this way of doing things to have been selected through evolution, there must have been very good reasons. Strong selective pressures that drove this change. But why go to all this trouble? Why move the center of visual processing from the optic tectum to visual cortex? If, as I just showed you, amphibians can be visually selective in how they interpret visual information, what is a cortex good for? For me, the most straightforward answer to this question is that the elaboration of sensory areas of cerebral cortex made it possible to represent many more stimulus feature dimensions. Let me clarify what I mean by that. Here I'm showing you a flattened map from the same paper that uh, Patrick referenced, Fellman and Van Essen, 91. And the map has been divided up into distinct regions. In several regions of visual cortex, it's been possible to demonstrate that neurons in those regions care about specific aspects of visual stimuli. For example, Patrick talked about the middle temporal, temporal area, or area MT, as being particularly important for stimulus motion. The neurons in MT are sensitive to specific directions of motion, in particular parts of visual space. In area V1, neurons are excited, uh, area V1 pointed out to you, neurons are excited by particular orientations of small edges or lines. Area V4 cares about color. Various chunks of IT cortex are responsive for objects or faces. This kind of distributed representation of visual stimulus features across a large populations of neurons allows for the unique encoding of a nearly endless variety of stuff. For example, a conjunction of neuron activations across areas V1, V4, MT and MT and others allowed you to just see, I hope, a yellow smiling face moving across the slide. In the evolved mammalian slash primate visual cortical scheme, conjunctions of values across feature dimensions make it possible to identify and discriminate many more objects than would otherwise be possible. The visual world of a frog is painted with a very broad brush, prey or predator, but we can easily recognize nine different kinds of orange or discriminate a real from a fake Rembrandt painting. But facilitating recognition and discrimination of a seemingly endless number of stimuli isn't the only thing that a visual cortex is good for. I mentioned that the behavioral responses evoked by visual stimuli in toads are stereotyped, they're fixed. This means that in terms of brain circuits, the mapping between stimulus and response is relatively hardwired. But a hardwired solution is impractical and difficult, frankly, to even imagine in the distributed representation scheme of primate visual cortex. If primates can recognize and discriminate an effectively endless number of visual objects, how could each object representation be uniquely wired up to specific behavioral responses? Indeed, with some exceptions, we simply don't have fixed behavioral responses for visual stimuli. We're able to flexibly interpret visual stimulus information depending on context. So let me show you what I mean by that. What behavioral response should this image evoke? Is there even a single fixed response that's appropriate all the time? If you're up to bat, you want to hit the ball. If you're the catcher, you want to catch the ball. If you're the umpire, you want to decide if the ball goes over the plate. And when you switch from being at bat to catching in the next half of the inning, you don't get confused and try to hit the ball with your glove. You know it's appropriate to execute different behaviors. So the interpretation or meaning of the visual stimuli for primates depends on context, on internal state. This flexible mapping between stimulus and response is a cornerstone of our cognitive abilities. So a visual cortex is good for recognizing and discriminating a huge variety of stuff, and it's good for flexibly interpreting the meaning of all that stuff depending on context. However, there are also important consequences and constraints that result from the cortical solution to vision. First, as the forebrain evolved, it didn't replace the already vital functions being performed by the midbrain and hindbrain. It evolved on top of existing brain structures. So newly evolved cortical vision abilities had to be integrated 
while respecting existing rules of, of brain function. This means that it's crucial to understand how interactions between cortical brain areas and subcortical brain areas, as they're called, constrain visual system function. Second, for flexible interpretation of visual signals to work over our lifespans, we have to be able to learn and relearn the meaning of visual information. When a kid picks up a video game controller and is shown visual imagery that is totally novel, in order to be able to play the game, they have to learn the meaning of totally new visual stimuli. And they're able to do this effortlessly in a matter of minutes. This is because interpreting those images, assigning meaning to those novel visual inputs is fundamental to our visual perceptual abilities. In the remaining time, I'm gonna go through some examples from studies of humans and monkeys that specifically demonstrate these two points. The first finding I wanna tell you about is from a study examining the consequences of damage to parts of a set of brain areas called the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are evolutionarily ancient subcortical structures that are, to my knowledge, found in all vertebrates. They are most well known for their role in motor control. The motor control deficits, for example, associated with Parkinson's disease result from damage to parts of the basal ganglia. This study looked at the visual processing consequences of damage to portions of the basal ganglia resulting from stroke or disease. What this work found was that this kind of damage can cause what's called visual neglect. Before I show you what this means, I wanna emphasize that these patients only had damage to subcortical structures. Visual cortex was undamaged. In this example, patients were given a model drawing and asked to simply copy it. What does the patient's copy look like? In this example copy, the patient has failed to include a large amount of detail from the left side of the image. We know the visual information was getting into the patient's brain, but as a result of damage to the basal ganglia, the patient is unable to make use of it. Their ability to use visual information to guide behavior has been disrupted. Another example of neglect can readily be seen in the line crossing task. The patient is given a piece of paper with a bunch of lines drawn on it like this. Their task is simply to turn all the lines into crosses by drawing on top of them. You can see something very similar to the previous example. The patient in this example has failed to turn most of the lines on the left side into crosses. Again, the patient's brain has access to the visual information in the left visual field, but can't make use of it. Damage to the basal ganglia has resulted in the patient being unable to make full use of the visual signals present in cortex. The example of neglect induced by damage to the basal ganglia shows that interactions between cortical and subcortical structures are crucial for the ability to make use of the visual information present in cortex. The information is there, but the patient can't act on it. They can't choose an appropriate behavioral response. I'd say they can't interpret it or they don't know what it means. Even more specific ideas about how the primate basal ganglia participate in visual functions come from studies in macaque monkeys. The monkeys in this study were trained to recognize and act on fractal images like these shown here. Some fractals were good objects associated with reward and other fractals were bad objects associated with no reward. The monkey was then tested in the following way. Good or bad objects were shown to the monkey on a computer screen. If the monkey was shown a good object and he looked at it, he got a reward. If the monkey was shown a bad object, he could look at it or not, but either way, he didn't get a reward and just had to wait until a good object was eventually shown. The monkeys performed well at this task. Looking at the good objects every time they're presented and mostly just ignoring the bad objects. Again, it's important to point out the importance of visual cortex. There is no doubt that the monkey's ability to recognize and discriminate good fractals from bad relies on visual cortical areas, particularly since the differences between good and bad can be quite subtle. Now comes the really interesting part. The researchers injected a small volume of a drug called bicuculine on one side of the brain in part of the basal ganglia called the globus pallidus. This drug hyperactivates neurons 
for a short time, allowing the researchers to examine how an artificially high level of activity in this part of the basal ganglia might affect behavior in this task. So how did this drug injection affect behavior? After injection, there was no change in the monkey's tendency to look at the good objects, but there was a substantial change in their tendency to look at bad objects. So here is an example in which visual cortex is completely intact and capable of doing its job. And yet these monkeys ability to use the information represented in visual cortex is impaired. And more specifically, it appears that the monkey's ability to suppress looking at valueless objects is impaired. They're unable to choose the appropriate action in response to the presentation of bad objects. I would describe this by saying that the monkeys are impaired in how they interpret the meaning of the object. Again, despite no damage to the visual cortical areas that allow them to discriminate the objects. To bring back the example of real and fake Rembrandts, despite possessing the ability to discriminate between the real and the fake, the good and the bad fractals, when activity in the subcortical basal ganglia was disrupted by injecting bicuculine, the animals behaved as if they no longer could discriminate between real and fake. What about the ability to flexibly interpret visual stimuli as meaning one thing in one context and something different in another context? As it turns out, recent evidence from the same lab, the Hikasaka lab, suggests that subcortical structures are vital for this function as well. In this work, the researchers trained monkeys that the reward value of fractal images was contingent on a background image. When object A was presented on top of scene X, its reward value was high. But when it was presented on top of scene Y, its reward value was low. The scenes are just black and white images from Google Maps. Uh, sorry about that. Meanwhile, object B had the opposite meaning, high value on top of scene Y and low on top of scene X. There were also a bunch of other objects that the monkey had to learn about besides A and B in a particular set. These context-dependent reward values were trained by presenting the monkeys with pairs of objects on top of a single scene, like uh, perhaps you can see here, and having them choose to look at one of them. So in the context of scene X, the monkey should look to the left at this object for a large reward, but for scene Y, he should look at the other object. <clears throat> and you can see here in this plot of good choice rate versus trials that the monkeys learn this contextual interpretation task very quickly, getting to a very high level of performance after just a couple of hundred trials. It's again important to point out visual cortex is important for this task and is intact. So now for the interesting part when the researchers manipulated the activity of neurons in the basal ganglia. In this work, the researchers injected a drug into what's called the tail of the caudate or putamen, two closely related anatomical subdivisions of the basal ganglia. This drug has a selective effect on a particular type of neuron, blocking its uh, ability to receive input signals. How does this drug affect the monkey's behavior? Comparing the time course of learning on a totally new set of objects, we can see that, as I showed you above, the monkeys learn well without the drug, but after the drug is injected, the monkeys fail to learn, they fail to assign a context-specific meaning to the object plus scene combinations. Importantly, drug injection did not affect performance for already learned contextual associations, and it also didn't affect the monkey's ability to learn non-contextual associations in which objects alone were associated with high or low reward, like in the previous study. These controls are important because they show that this is a specific effect on the ability of monkeys to learn to flexibly interpret the value of these visual stimuli in a context-dependent fashion, not a generic effect on learning in general, nor even on learning value associations. To summarize, these monkeys with perfectly intact visual cortical areas were unable to flexibly interpret the meaning of visual stimuli depending on context when the normal functioning of the basal ganglia was disrupted. This work again highlights how interactions between visual cortex and basal ganglia are vital for primates' visual system functions. 
Today, I talked a little, talked to you a little bit about what I call the extended primate visual system. The evolutionary change from a more simplified visual system centered in the optic tectum to a cortical visual system in mammals and primates had important benefits and associated consequences. Cortical vision allows primates to recognize and discriminate a nearly endless variety of visual stuff, but because the cortex was built on top of an existing system, it had to respect the brain's existing way of doing things, with the consequence of making interactions between cortical and subcortical structures critical for primate vision. Another consequence of an elaborated primate cortical visual system is the impracticality of hardwired associations between stimuli and responses. Instead, primates are able to flexibly map vision onto action, but this flexibility requires mechanisms to learn and relearn those mappings. Going forward, an understanding of exactly how neuronal activity across the extended primate visual system facilitates perception and the assigning of meaning to visual stimuli will be crucial for the development of technologies for cortical visual restoration. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Wow. Well, wow, thank you. And um, I have to say that that was that was a very, very interesting uh, presentation, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, I, I have, I'm learning a lot today about the whole visual cortex. There's a lot going on uh, when people see. I think we think of vision as very passive, but obviously the brain's very active and the eyes are very active. Um, I, and if you're, if someone is very, um, if someone loses vision in terms of that stimulus over time, uh, do we know how much, how much function is lost um, from the brain in terms of its ability to re-stimulate some of that activity when we have these types of devices in the future to do so? That's my question, <laughs> and I'll get to some others that are that are already coming in. So I have a, a favorite example uh, that speaks to that point, which is um, Oliver Sacks, the well-known uh, neurologist, had an example, a case study that he published in the New Yorker uh, of uh, a masseuse, uh, a masseur rather, I suppose, um, who had terrible cataracts for, I think it was 30 or 40 years, and finally had the cataracts removed after an extended period of time with no vision. So he'd had vision uh, as a young man, but then lost it for many, many years. When his vision was restored by the removal of these cataracts, he didn't understand what he was seeing. He had pets, cats and dogs, and he reported that he would you know, see these, these fuzzy blobs of stuff moving. And it wasn't until he was able to touch them that he understood what they were. And I think this provides a striking example of the way that you know, we do need to continually learn and relearn what things mean. And that even if we've had visual experience, that after extended periods of time without it, we need to relearn it. So I would say that, you know, it, it is likely that if you've had extended visual experience, uh, it's far more likely that a visual cortical prosthetic device would um, sort of integrate in uh, readily usable ways than if you have not had visual experience. And, and exactly that kind of question is one that I'm hoping to address with, with my research going forward. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I, I see we have in our audience a lot of very, I know, very, very smart people. I, I recognize some of your names. And uh, we just, uh, so uh, please ask questions. You, you're going to, you have uh, the opportunity to really learn from some, some pretty, uh, uh, pretty special people here. So uh, we have a few I'll get to, and uh, please keep them coming if you like. Um, if these technologies become therapies for patients? Is it more beneficial or, or likely to succeed in someone who has had vision previously and lost it, as opposed to someone who has never had vision? 
So I think that's basically your same your same question um, sort of, yeah. that we ju we just addressed. Uh, so yes, I, can, I think absolutely. Yeah, I can try means. to yeah can try to get a bit more into that. Uh, so we learned a lot over the past few years. Actually, this question is a very old question. It was asked in the 18th century. Uh, it's called the problem of Moliner. It's uh, the subject of a. Uh, a book written by uh, the philosopher Diderot, and it's exactly the question that Jim was asking, uh, referring to the story by Oliver Sacks. Uh, the story was in the uh, 18th century, cataract surgery was starting to become efficient and less dangerous, and uh, there was a big discussion. Uh, if you take a, a blind born, someone was blind from birth and uh, from cataract, and you get the cataract out, is this blind person who never saw for all his life going to be able to recognize the object or will this person need to touch the object to recognize the shapes and then make sense out of it? So this was the question that Molina was asking. Uh, he was a psychophysicist, we would say now, it's, this title didn't exist at that time, but uh, this is the question he was asking and actually was referring to a very famous mathematician who was blind and was exactly experiencing that. And until recently, it was more a theoretical question but uh, there were about two big experiments that occurred. One uh, occurred in India uh, over the past uh, few decades, actually led by MIT and a very good prominent scientist in India doing cataract surgery on a large scale. Uh, other efforts have been conducted in parallel. Uh, and uh, it was shown very clearly that even for people that never had seen in their life, they were still able to have a good appreciation of space and recognize objects. Um, there was still a controversy whether these people never had vision, or maybe some of them had vision in early days, but there is no documentation on that. But given the number of people they treated, and given the quality of the work that was performed, and including for some of them brain recording, brain analysis, it's very likely that there is a, a level of uh, treatment of information that is uh, encoded genetically and not by the experience. And that experience is fine tuning what we are able to use from our circuits. Experiment that occurred uh, in the past 15 years is the gene therapy that was conducted in children affected with labor congenital amaurosis. It's a, a very severe form of retinitis pigmentosa that is affecting children at birth. And uh, a gene therapy was developed uh, in Philadelphia, which is now commercial, and uh, we are now a center in Pittsburgh to, to do it here. Uh, my Paris Center was the first in Europe to do it, and uh, it's pretty amazing to see these kids that had not seen for many years being able to see, to move in the space, not perfect vision. I think I've showed a couple of movies already on that. And uh, interestingly, these kids, uh, where cortical recording performed, they have a pretty good appreciation of space and they can recognize objects. The issue is that probably some of these kids had vision for the first year. So we are not fully sure that there was no vision from birth. But the good news, and I think it's fitting with a lot of data from science, is probably the mapping in the brain is at least in large part genetically encoded. But it's very coarse the fine tuning occurs with visual experience. So it's a combination of the two. It's not like the innate and the acquired are to be opposed, they are to be combined. And uh, this is due to the fact that we have a wonderful brain plasticity and this brain plasticity can be trained. And what both uh, Patrick and Jim are working on, the training the eye to see and the experience and the ability to focus your attention to make more sense of what we see is a critical part, is an integral part of this uh, ability to recognize objects and to see. So this is a fascinating field. It has a lot of philosophical applications, a lot of uh, considerations on life. Is We see what we want to see and we learn how to see. So nothing is obvious in that. Uh, obvious comes from vision, but doesn't exist actually. Everything has to be learned, has to be uh, getting a lot of appraisal and experience is key in all of that. And so this is where these bright scientists are so important to, to make to help us in, in getting where we want to be, because it's not going to be a plug and play. You put a, a prosthesis on the brain and it's going to work. No, it's not going to work. You have to try. And my experience with vision restoration through prosthetics and optogenetic has been that training of a patient and patient experience and involvement of a patient, engagement of a patient is making all the difference in the success we have observed. Thank you, Dr. Sahel. 
Another question here. Are, the, are other cortical visual stimulating technologies that bypass the eyes um, that are currently being used in human subjects. Are there any currently that are being used on human subjects? So there is an ongoing study uh, called the Orion trial, uh, which is a technology that stemmed from the uh, initial cortical prosthesis developed by Second Sight, and uh, which is now no longer available. But the, the device was applied to the brain. And uh, I think a year and a half ago, as a beautiful paper published in uh, Cell, a very good journal, uh, for a few patients using this technology and also some electrodes that were implanted in the brain for another condition. So I think six subjects altogether, showing that there was some ability to see very coarse vision, very rudimentary vision. But the important part of that paper, which actually relates to the previous discussion, is that there was a protocol for exploring the image uh, that was based on the way the eye movements are exploring the image. So they interfered from the way we what Patrick and Jim are doing, the way we explore, we read, we try to implement that into the application of a prosthesis to stimulate the brain and to show some signals. So this is promising. I have to say that the number of electrodes and the, the technique for the implantation make it unlikely that this would give excellent vision to patients, but it's showing us that at least there is a path forward that we can explore to, to stimulate. And there are a few other groups. There is a group in Utah that developed a very famous Utah prosthesis. And many decades ago, there was a famous uh, Dobell that implanted some electrodes in the brain of people. I say famous, but actually it was not that great uh, to say the least for, for people. So we have to be careful, but sometimes we should not believe that science is always beneficial if we don't really apply it very carefully to, to people. Yeah. Thank you again. Um, we have a, another question on the board and um, it says here, they recognize some of the terminology is similar to work being done at Wilmer Eye in Baltimore. Are you collaborating with people like uh, Dr. Campichero, I may have said that wrong, on retina restoration or uh, Quigley on glaucoma. You, you, okay, I'll take, I'll take that one too. So I think the work okay. of Pete Campochero has nothing to do with cortical vision. He's working on the pharmacology to protect photoreceptors, which is parallel to another of my work, uh, which we are conducting. And uh, this is beautiful what Pete Campocari is doing on that, but it has nothing to do, at least to my knowledge, with cortical stimulation. Uh, with respect to Harry Quigley, he has been working on glaucoma for many years. He was the one who demonstrated that uh, loss of many ganglion cells precedes the start of the loss of visual field. And this helped a lot of people to understand better the relationship between the loss of structure and of function. But again, this was at the optic nerve level, and at the uh, ganglion cell level. No, I don't think it was mostly at the cortical level. There is some work at the cortical level in glaucoma that is very interesting, actually. And I think uh, Patrick alluded to that briefly to, to start with. But uh, this is not exactly the same area. So we are, of course, we know these people, we collaborate with them, and uh, but this is not the area for the webinar today. We collaborate with other people across the world, actually. And, uh, and actually, the two new recruits we have come from very good labs we continue to have a relationship with. <laughs> Now, uh, this looks like our last question and we're just about out of time as it is. Would this cortical simulation or gene therapy also work for children with gradually degenerative vision like ushers or Zellweger with vision involvement? Um, and then also does insurance cover these therapies? And uh, I, I imagine again, Dr. Sell, this one may be for you. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the uh, well, when you put a clinician, they, they tend to steal from the scientists, the people <laughs> who do the real work. But anyway, uh, I hope they won't resent that. Uh, the uh, Usher is more retinal disease. So this is where gene therapy, optogenetics, uh, retinal prosthesis uh, are likely to help. And actually, this is already happening a bit. Uh, actually, uh, Foundation Fighting Blindness is, uh, has a big seminar, a big webinar that is going to be on uh, the 13th, September 13th, I'm, I'm, I'm chairing this webinar. This is a very full day session uh, that Foundation Fighting Blind is organizing on Usher 1B. And uh, I led a very big consortium on Usher syndrome, and we have a big three-day symposium 
uh, again on the web uh, early October. So I'll give information to Loni. This is free and open to everyone, including a patient education session on that. So, but this type of uh, disease, because it's uh, located at the I, at the retinal level, there are other technologies that are in development, uh, like gene therapy, prosthetics, optogenetics, and even stem cells. Uh, so what we try to focus today is uh, the situation where this is not possible because the retina is damaged, the optic nerve is damaged, and there is no way to, to get the information through this channel. So you have to go directly to the brain. And uh, so this is the, the type of research that we need to develop a breakthrough research we need to, break, to develop. And we want to, we will develop. Thank you so much. Um, it, gentlemen, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Herman, Dr. Mayo, Dr. Sahel. And, uh, and my team here from the Ioneer Foundation helping us put these together. Um, we'll look forward to uh, presenting an, another program for you in two weeks. Um, and we'll again, be continuing these on um, and, uh, and hope everybody is appreciated. Please fill out your surveys. And again, thank you for those who have supported the work that we have going on at the Ioneer Foundation. Um, uh, have a wonderful Friday and enjoy the weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.